Welcome back and hello to anyone new listening. Most of us probably live in an urban area. And of course, there are many insects that live in these areas too, whether we see them or not. Today on episode 90, we're going to explore how these insects adapt to city living, the roles they play in urban ecosystems, and get into the different disciplines of urban entomology. Urban entomology, as the name suggests, is the study of insects in their communities in urban areas, along with how they affect humans. Cities are actually teeming with insect life just as they are humans, but many people in cities are too busy with their daily lives and all the entertainment around them to realize it. Let's first dig into urban ecology, which is a discipline in urban entomology focused on how insects interact with and are affected by urbanization. Insects are incredibly adaptable creatures, as you know, and city life is no exception. Urban ants, for example, have shown remarkable resilience. Species like the pavement ant, Tetramorium immigrans, are incredibly adept at navigating the cracks and crevices of sidewalks and buildings. They thrive in these environments by exploiting food sources left behind by us. Yes, those crumbs you drop? Perfect ant snacks. Pavement ants are known for living in urban areas, which is how they got the name. But now, let's look at a different ant species which has adapted to urban landscapes as well. The house ant, or sugar ant, Tapanoma sicily, is the most common house invading ant in the United States, and probably Canada as well, because its native range is North America. However, its natural habitat is actually under leaf litter, logs, and rocks and forests. So how did this woodland ant become such a common pest in urban places? The ant's behavior actually changes when taken out of the woods. The ants usually only form a small single queen colony, but in cities and urban environments, the ants build vast multi-queen colonies under sidewalks and other man-made structures. These ants are also called odorous ants because they release a coconut-like smell when crushed or killed. Ants aren't the only insects that have learned to adapt to urbanized areas, though. The next highlight would be crickets. You expect these to be found in fields and more quiet areas, but crickets are very versatile, and they really don't need much to survive. Entomologist Michael Rapp from Maryland University states that crickets are perfectly adapted to live in cities. All they need is a square foot of dirt, planter box, or small garden space. Even those small squared out spaces for trees along roadsides and walking streets in cities are enough for crickets to lay their eggs. The most common cricket species found in the East Coast cities like New York is Gryllus pennsylvanicus. These are the large black field crickets commonly found in, well, fields. Their chirp is synonymous with late summer and early fall and sounds a bit like this. Crickets are detritivores, so for them, any kind of food will do, which includes the leftovers we throw in trash cans or on the ground along with other debris. Now you might be asking, what draws crickets into cities like the Big Apple? Because it can't possibly be that ideal. And it's not. The crickets are attracted to the flashy lights of the big cities. The temperature in cities are also warmer than more rural places, so that might actually be helpful for them as well and prolong their singing days. Now, speaking of Pennsylvania and crickets, a study in 2020 actually looked at the diversity of nighttime singing crickets and katydids across three different levels of urban near downtown State College. Those areas would be rural, suburban, and of course, urban. And yes, the name of the college is actually Downtown State College. I didn't believe it either. Anyway, the research was conducted through auditory cues, only because many katydids prefer to live high up in vegetation that's not easily accessible. But what we care about are the results of this study, because it was actually found that the most diversity is seen in suburban environments as opposed to rural and forested. The researchers believe this is because suburban environments have the greatest number of habitat niches that support both more rural and more urban species of crickets and katydids. It could also be that lights in suburban environments pull in a greater number of species that wouldn't normally be found in close quarters. 
That's just an afterthought I have, though, and wasn't really brought up in the reading I found. A similar study in Germany looked at insect diversity in urban areas across three different elevations. Canopy, which I can only assume meant the uppermost portion of trees, the bush layer, which is the lower layer of a tree, and then insects on the trunk underneath the bush layer. The results found that urbanization actually filters out insects without wings and negatively impacts species richness and diversity within the canopy and bush layers. The insects that are found on lower levels, like the tree trunk for example, were not statistically different between cities and more rural environments. Conversely, the abundance of insects in the bush layer actually increased with urbanization, and the canopy layer had no statistical difference. Now obviously, this alludes to the fact that in urban areas, insects which can actually survive are going to congregate in greater numbers where they can. So to me, this is not all that surprising. The same way there's a stupid amount of cockroaches and bedbugs in larger cities compared to out in the forest. And that's where pest management comes in. We can't have a discussion on urban entomology without mentioning pest control. These days, IPM or Integrated Pest Management is at the forefront. Integrated stands for the use of environmentally friendly practices or even biological control as part of the management. This is in contrast to traditional methods of mindlessly dumping chemicals that could cause harm to all forms of life. People using IPM are made aware of the life cycles, behavior, and natural predators to the pests they're trying to manage. They use the information available to form environmentally safe strategies. Honestly, this topic could be its own episode, which is why I'm not going to go any further into this. But just be aware that IPM is the hot new way to control pests in all environments and is related to urban entomology. But not all pests are equal in the world of entomology, and some of them are wrecking havoc for not only the local people, but the local insects and plant life. That's right, I'm talking about invasive insects. This is a type of control focused exclusively on non-native insects that are getting out of hand because they have nothing to kill them off. Perfect examples for invasive pest management insects include emerald ash borers, Asian tiger mosquitoes, winter moths, and Asian longhorn beetles. These animals not only pose threats to us, but our surrounding and local greenery, which is why taking care of them is important. My old roommate in university from Worcester, Massachusetts, lost all the trees in his neighborhood to the Asian longhorn beetles. That cost a lot of money to cut and remove those trees, which of course you'd want to do because it's an eyesore otherwise. But the beetles also depleted a much needed resource for other insects living in the city. Now, another side discipline related to pest management is structural entomology. This focuses on insects that could damage the structural integrity of man-made buildings, such as termites, carpenter ants, carpenter bees, and wood boring beetles like the aforementioned Asian longhorn beetle. Did you know that termites actually cause over 5 billion USD in property damage every year? And that's just in the United States. Here's another fun fact. Structural entomologists use dogs to sniff out termites. Just like we learned that dogs can sniff out bed bug infestations. They're particularly useful for early infestations when there might not be a lot of evidence. It's better to get things assessed before it's really too late. Something else to know is that urban entomology does not strictly mean relating to cities or incredibly urban areas. These kinds of practices and studies are done wherever there are people building and living, which includes rural as well. Some other common disciplines include medical entomology, forensic entomology, and public health entomology. Now you might be wondering how medical and public health are different and it comes down to the scope of their applications. Public health entomology has a broader scope that encompasses the effects of insect pathogens on a community which can be both physical and mental. They're also out and about helping to spread awareness through public outreach and educating the public on things they can do in the now to help lessen the negative impacts of whatever the threat is. They also teach about potential health concerns related to insect causing problems. These people often collaborate with others like public officials, policy experts, and even people in other medical fields like epidemiology or environmental scientists. This isn't to say that medical entomologists aren't doing a lot of work, but they're more research-based and in the lab working to make treatments or ways to prevent further infection. 
The work medical entomologists do is crucial for tackling vectors and diseases, along with preventing future outbreaks, which can be used on a global scale. I've been watching a lot of Dexter recently, so the analogy that comes to my mind is that medical entomologists are the lab geeks on a homicide squad who run the blood test and do the molecular work, while the public health entomologists are the detectives out working the case, talking, informing people, and collecting more information. And that's honestly going to wrap up this episode for Insects for Fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And of course, make sure to rate and review this show on Spotify and Apple. But the best way to support the show is to join the Patreon. And a big shout out goes to our newest member, Brittany. Patreon is not just a charity. On Patreon, you can find bonus episodes, ad-free episodes, vlogs, and more. The vlog season is just getting started, and I've already got a backlog of videos I need to edit and throw onto Patreon, featuring some really nice insect finds and adventures. There is, of course, also the Discord and Instagram, as well as the Facebook page, and links to everything will be available in the show notes. Thank you again for listening.